Okay, we are live. Uh, so for those listening at home, welcome to the Live from the Sword Coast podcast. My name is Kevin Madison, and I will be your friendly dungeon user today. Uh, today, I am continuing on in my series of videos to participate in the RPG A Day event for 2018. I'm just going to double check, make sure we're actually streaming here. Come on, work with me, work with me. Um, it does appear that we are streaming. Let's make sure that we're actually... Yep, and there's a picture and everything, so that's terrific. Um, so uh, today's question, this is a, an exercise where uh, every day in the month of August, uh, we answer a different question about role-playing games for um, the, well, I mean, each day dealing with different issues. And this year, it seems like they're themed to be different sort of like how, what, you know, different themes for each or different um, starting questions or starting words for each uh, each day. Today's question is how can... How can we get more people playing? Uh, and uh, as with all my other entries, I'm going to try and keep this to 10 minutes. So I'm looking at my clock right now and seeing, uh, setting the, uh, the time. So I was thinking about this and there's, I've got some coaching to my answer. I do have an answer for how I introduce people to role playing, but I want to coach it in one specific term. So um, there's, uh, there's definitely a, you know, uh, we're living in a time when uh, role playing and gaming and stuff like that is definitely not the, you know, um, really, really niche hobby that it used to be. You know, at the time of recording last night, uh, the actor Joe Manganiello was on Stephen Colbert's show talking about, you know, one of the top uh, talk shows in uh, the country, talking about Dungeons and Dragons. And like, he was there to promote this brand he's got for it too, but that's nine minutes of, you know, prime time network TV where people are talking about D&D. &D. And that's awesome. That is absolutely not the world that I grew up in. Um, however, <laughs> There still is a, um, it still is a, not necessarily a stigma, I would say, but it can become the defining thing about you if you are not in certain industries. So uh, if you are working in creative industries, I think that they're like, you know, if you're working for, uh, if you're a writer or if you're in, uh, you know, special effects or something like that, or you're in, in any kind of creative sort of endeavor, there isn't necessarily going to be the stigma of that, well, you play D&D, &D, so this is what you, you know, um, this is what we think of you. Uh, however, if you are in um, any other sort of normal industry, in particular professional industry, I think that there still is some difficulty with uh, uh, not having that be the thing that defines you. So uh, the reason I, I mention this is because recently I tweeted about how uh, I'm a lawyer, my, my day job, and uh, our firm, I'm on our student recruitment committee. And one of the uh, applicants from this year's uh, uh, process for the articling process where you come and like, you know, you mentor to become a lawyer. Uh, one of them put down that she was a dungeon master on her resume. And I tweeted about that. I said, like, this is fucking awesome. Like, what, what kind of world are we in now where people are, you know, it's, it, they're that comfortable with what they, you know, with identifying gaming as their hobby. Um, and then very quickly uh, had some of the senior partners, you know, point that out as a reason to not even give this person an interview. And uh, that person was specifically uh, identified as being, how did the dungeon master present and stuff like that. So um, that told me that my, uh, my nagging doubts about whether to share <laughs> with my workplace in any kind of public way, what I do, you know, with my spare time, um, it certainly uh, answered that question. Uh, and there's, it made me think of, you know, what, what sort of been my adage for the last 10 years or so is, uh, there's a funny line in, um, uh, 30 rock where, uh, Jack, uh, um, uh, whatever, um, Alec, uh, Baldwin's character is in that he hires a private investigator who is Steve Buscemi to go and investigate, you know, to sort of do like the find dirt on him, you know, to clear him for going higher up. And, uh, he founds, he finds that he's got a hobby of collecting dolls, I think, if I remember correctly, or Hummels or something like that. And Steve Buscemi's character's got a line that, you know, the guy with a weird hobby doesn't get the corner office. And I don't mean to say that that D&D &D is, is a weird hobby by any means. It's my favorite pastime, or gaming in general is my favorite pastime, certainly. But um, it is not, it still is something that, that holds a lot of uh, association. I think once another generation cycles through, it will not have that same, you know, um, immediate association with, um, you know, basement dwelling, you know, the, the worst stereotypes of what, what people think gamers are, are like. Um, and the, um, and it won't become a defining thing, you know, in the same way that like, if uh, someone is big into cycling, that becomes the thing about them. 
and lawyers are also remorseless gossips. So I really don't want, you know, I have made a, not a concerted effort to hide necessarily what my hobby is, but I, I, I'm not evangelizing with it. Like, oh, you got to sit down and play some D&D &D and they'll change, you know, you'll like it. The other thing I'm cognizant of too, is that, you know, knowing my own taste, there's a lot of stuff that I just don't, you know, I'm exposed to it and I, I and whatnot, but I just don't like it. You know, like there are, I don't like sports video games, you know, like I, I like a lot of video games. I just don't like those. I don't like uh, strategic games. I understand why people like playing games like Civ and stuff like that. It's just not for me. You know, I, I don't see the appeal in it. So um, I'm careful with, in terms of bringing people into the hobby, I am careful with that as well too. That said, you know, um, one of the ways that I introduce people to the hobby is, well, there's two different approaches I have, um, both of which are basically the same principle as there's that, you know, bit of trivia that, you know, if you dump a toad into hot boiling water, it'll jump out. But if you slowly raise the temperature, they won't notice and they'll get uh, cooked. Well, I um, have cooked some toads in my uh, in my uh, lifetime. And the way I've done that is by degrees. You know, I. Uh, I have some friends who I um, I know through my my uh, day job who I slowly you know introduced to more and more role playing elements in um, board games. You know we start with games like um, uh, you know like like Axe and Allies or things like that, and then we gradually get to stuff you know, to like Iron Kingdoms um, Undercity, where you're doing some actual kind of role playing, and Star Wars, where there's sort of uh, Star Wars um, Rebel Assault, I think is what it's called. What is it called? uh imperial assault sorry not rebel assault uh where there is sort of a dm and there's players and whatnot and you slowly sort of walk the person towards that uh that's one way of uh, I, I have um got people closer and closer to actually playing an actual role-playing game and being comfortable playing an actual role-playing game uh and the other way is by picking games that have as little um as little opportunities for them to bounce off of things. Uh, I know that there's a lot of folks who have success with just introducing people to, to D and D, but you know, for, I find that for a lot of folks in particular, non gaming things, that's the, that's the immediate, Oh, I don't like that. And there's a pre, you know, predisposed sort of attitude uh, towards not liking that. And there's lots of opportunities for you to bounce off of D and D. And like, if you don't like the goofy races or the, the, you know, fictional world or, you, you know, having to go on quests or shit like that. And like, that's not to say that that's what all D and D is, but if that's what people have in their mind that we're going to talk in funny voices and whatever else, then that's there's just too many opportunities for them to disengage and shut down and not want to actually engage with what makes the game fun. However, if you start with a game instead, like Call of Cthulhu or like um, Delta Green is one I've been using uh, with great success in the last little while because Delta Green is basically just a Call of Cthulhu game. So the mechanics are pretty low intensity, which means you're not having to spend a lot of time focusing on the you know what you need to do mechanically what numbers you need to add on your character sheet uh it's set in the real world so there's not a lot of buy-in that's required or extra you know learning that needs to happen for them to figure out what's you know what the sensibilities of the world are and um it's a mystery and everyone knows how to fucking engage with a mystery everyone had does that by watching mystery fiction on tv or movies or whatever and um horror is a great um, is a great way to slowly introduce people to some supernatural elements in, in a game as well. You know, because in particular for a game like Delta Green, uh, in the most recent edition, uh, at the time of recording, there is a lot of great, um, it, there's a real emphasis on it being secretive. Like you slowly reveal that stuff. You kind of pick one major thing to be the, the threat, or at least this is how they encourage it. And then you slowly reveal it. So it's like cultists. Um, the first season of um, True Detectives, I've heard described as a perfect called Cthulhu campaign. And I totally, totally agree. That is a way that you can get people who may be predisposed towards saying, oh, I don't like this. And then what you can do is if, they, if you get comfortable with them playing that kind of game, you can slowly introduce more weird stuff. You know, with uh, I've got a group of friends who I started with Delta Green, who then we moved, you know, played that for a little bit. And then I started, um, I introduced them to... Oh, what's that game called? Um, it's the gumshoe superhero game, uh, Mutant City Blues, which got them more thinking about some narrative dice mechanics. So they got them thinking a little more comprehensive or a little more complex um, game going on and got them a little more used to more supernatural and their characters having supernatural abilities because they're playing basically superhero detectives. Uh, and then the next step in that is going to be um, coming up where we're going to play some old school D&D. &D. 
Uh, and that's been that gradual introduction to get them comfortable with, oh, this is what the actual, this is what I do in this game. This is what it involves. And, um, you know, and, and it reduces the, uh, ex the opportunities for the, the players to bounce off of. Now, just like I said, like how I don't like certain things, there's just going to be people who just don't like, you know, X or Y, you know, there are people in the gaming community. I've got gaming uh, friends and uh, people who are in my group, uh, my regular group, who just won't play certain types of games because that's not why they game. They don't game to just play role-playing games. They like specific types of games. So um, anyway, getting back to um, the, the actual question for the day, how can we get more people playing? I think by, by picking your opportunities uh, with people who maybe seem like they might be inclined to, to like gaming but may have some reservations about diving into a you know picking up and playing a dwarven cleric or something like that um and the way we do that for me is by slowly introducing them now that's the, the reason i mentioned all the the backstory about you know my relationship to not being you know my not being an evangelist for for role-playing games in my personal life or in my professional life at least um that's the reason why i take that approach you know i think that the dramatic success of fifth edition D and and uh, the spillover from um the streaming games like critical role and stuff like that that have been driving people to to go and play these you know these things and they're diving directly into D, &D that's fucking fantastic but i think there is a degree of self-selection that happens there where it's people who are already inclined to watch that kind of stuff and then go from there into a fantasy hobby what i'm thinking of is people who would never watch critical role who would never you know at best would tolerate you know a fantasy movie or something like that they may be fans of the marvel films but they'll never pick up a comic book or something like that those are the people who i'm thinking of is the ones that you slowly bring them in so anyway that is my um my answer to today's question uh tomorrow's question is let's see let's see let's see tomorrow's question is how has a game surprised you um, yeah, actually, I am really looking forward to answering that one. I've got a pretty, uh, hopefully a short answer, but there's been some recent ways that games have surprised me uh, in the last little while. So I look forward to that. Now, um, if you have any comments, questions, or concerns, or if you've got some ideas on how we can um, bring more people into the hobby, uh, please don't hesitate to leave a comment in the comment section below. Um, you can shoot me uh, a tweet on Twitter uh, where you can find me as at, you know, as Dungeon Musings. Sorry, I'm still bit of a Twitter novice. Um, you can also email me at dungeonmusings at gmail.com. So it's dungeonmusings, all one word and plural on musings. And uh, uh, you also may notice that we have two links in the description of the video below. Those are to the uh, charity fundraising campaign that we're currently running on the channel, uh, which are we're calling Heroes Save Villages. This is an um, a charity fundraising initiative where we've paired up with SOS Children's Villages International, a really terrific charity that um, benefits uh, high needs children, both in terms of advocating for them and also for providing direct services. Uh, you can find more information about the campaign. You can donate uh, at the uh, one link through to the Heroes Save Villages campaign. And uh, you can find a video or a link to a video where I give my reasons for setting up a campaign in my relationship with SOS Children's Villages International. Um, this is by no means an obligatory thing. Please, please don't feel obligated to contribute. But if you have enjoyed the, the uh, videos, I, I'd ask that you consider uh, clicking through and learning a little bit about the campaign and then uh, possibly donating because every dollar goes directly to SOS Children's Villages International and helps them do the very, very good work that they are doing. Um, there's also some cool rewards on there. Well, there's two rewards, one of which is very, very cool, one of which is kind of cool. Uh, and I'm hoping to add some more rewards in the next week or so as well. So, anyway. That's my answer for today. I'm already past my my uh, self-imposed timeline, so I'm going to get out of here, and I'll see you back tomorrow for tomorrow's question. Thanks, and we'll see you folks soon.